Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. You'd either have to be sick, providentially handed or backslidden not to be in God's house today if you're saved. Now, I appreciate you that are present here. Now, I appreciate you out in the radio listening audience. May God bless you today as you listen in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to many people. Now, the music and the message will be on cassette tape. It'll be tape number 190. If you'd like to have this tape, we'll send it out for a gift of $3, in which we use the gift to help defray our radio expense. And it's tape 190. Now, if you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, we'd be glad to send you a list. We can send you about a list of about 186. We have a few others we haven't put on the list as yet. Now, the tape last Sunday, tape number 189, was Why Worry, Worry What? Everybody needs that tape. And we have many good cassette tape that can be a blessing to you, and especially to dear shut-in people out in the radio listen audience. And write in and get these tape because in getting them, you have to take care of the radio expense. Now, this is radio anniversary month. If God permits us to uh, continue to broadcast the gospel through the last day of this month, the month of August, that will complete 37 years of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. That's 37 years of daily broadcasting. When we went on the air, it was predicted by many, you'll never make it. You'll never be able to stay on. Great preachers have been on the radio, and a little fellow like you, Brother Edwards, can't make it on radio by faith. That's been 37 years ago almost, and I guess some of those people that are not dead still said, well, I wondered how he made it. Well. God put us on the air, and God's kept us on the air, and God has spoken to the hearts of his people to work with us, and there's a few of you people that's been standing by this ministry since we've been on the air for 37 years. They have come and gone, and God's blessed and used the ministry. There's people in heaven today because of it. There's people preaching the gospel because of it. There's people on the mission field because of this radio ministry. There's churches been organized and built because of this ministry. And we thank God for the open door. It's the hand of God. God opened the door. And I most certainly would want to be guilty of trying to close it. I want it to stay open until God says it's enough. And when God says it's enough, that'll be it. So the Lord willing, 37 years the radio broadcast will come to a completion. At the end of this month, the Lord willing. Radio month, write to me. In the past, we've had a few people that say, Preacher Edwards, I want to send you a dollar each year you've been on the air, and I appreciated that. It's helped us defray our radio expense. If God should move up on your heart sometime this month to do that. It'll be appreciated, of course. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8, Acts chapter 2, and of course, chapter 4 of Acts. I want to read first of all from 1 Kings chapter 8. I'm going to speak today on this subject, the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem. Let's find out a little something about it and why it was there, why God started the church in Jerusalem. And it's a real pattern. It should be for our churches today. If you want to find out what kind of church we need, look at the church in Jerusalem back in the beginning. Now you say, what does 1 Kings chapter 8 have to do with it? Well, I want to point out to you something about how God meets his people. In verse 12... It says there, Then spake Solomon the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who spake with his mouth unto David my father, and has with his hand fulfilled it, saying, since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein. 
but I chose David to be over my people in Israel. And it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well, it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build a house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build a house unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen in the, up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, and the Lord promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now set there a place for the ark wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now that's as far as I'm reading in 1 Kings. Now turn to Acts chapter 2, will you please? And let's take a look beginning at uh, uh, verse uh, 42, Acts 2, 42. Page 1152. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 of Acts chapter 4. We began reading there with verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was on, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace upon them all. Neither was there any among them that liked, for as many as were possessed of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which has been interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, you don't have to turn there, but it says there that Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I would not want to live in a land where there's no church. I believe with all of my heart the reason God has stayed his hand from pouring his wrath out upon America is because of the great churches that believe the Bible and God's people, of course, that operate in those buildings. We thank God for the privilege and the place of worship. In Old Testament days, the Bible said that God met with the people there at the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies there at the ark. God's kind of glory came upon that tabernacle. God did not have a designated spot like a church building where to meet his people, but he met them there at the tabernacle. And they wandered around from place to place there in the God to do it. He began to accumulate some of the material for the job. God said, David, you can't do it. You have fought too many battles. You've shed too much blood. I'm not going to let you build that temple. I will let your son Solomon erect the temple. And so when David died and went on home to be with God, his son Solomon built one of the most beautiful and magnificent temples that's ever been erected. There he took the Ark of the Covenant that God used in the tabernacle and carried the Ark of the Covenant inside of that beautiful temple and placed it in the, uh, in the temple of God. That's the last account you have of the Ark. That's the end of the Ark. You have nothing else about the Ark in the Old Testament. It was placed there in that beautiful, beautiful temple. Of course, the temple was torn down later, but God met with his people. God said, this is my house. And God met with his people there and they worshiped. Now, over in the New Testament, you remember Jesus on one occasion went into the temple. This is not the one Solomon built. The one Solomon built had been torn down because old Belshazzar brought the people out of there. They tore down the, the uh, temple that Solomon had built. Later on, it was rebuilt. And then in the days of Jesus, there was a temple there. And it was still called the house of God. And Jesus went into that temple. He said, this is my father's house, a place of prayer. He honored the temple, the place of worship. He drove out the money changers and those who made merchandise 
of the house of God and he wanted to be a place of worship. And then when Jesus died and went back to heaven, then God laid upon the hearts of the apostles and the people to organize their churches. And you have this early church organized in Jerusalem there after the day of Pentecost. Now on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 people. The church had a very humble beginning. Only 120 stuck it out on the day of Pentecost until the Spirit of God came. And the Spirit of God came and baptized all of them into one body. And there you have the beginning of the local church there in Jerusalem. And so they began to worship God there in Jerusalem. Now God had told the people to go out from there and carry the gospel as missionaries, as preachers and so forth. But they were having such a good time there in Jerusalem, they kindly decided that they'd just maybe hang around a little longer. They were liking it there. And God allowed a young boy, a young man by the name of Saul, a little Jew, to go in there and raise the devil and persecute them and, and scatter them like a stone thrown among a covey of quail. And when Saul of Tarsus got in there and got through with that crowd, they would scattered out and gone in the directions where God intended for them to go. Now God allowed Saul to do that, to scatter his people. They were hanging around the temple there too much hanging around Jerusalem when God said, I want you to go out and carry the gospel message all over the known world. And so when God got through with Saul, letting him scatter his people, then uh, Paul had some, uh, Saul rather, had some warrants in his pocket, headed for Damascus. And on the way to Damascus, God struck him down and saved him and said, Saul, I'm going to show you what great things you must suffer my namesake. And I want you to carry the gospel message as a missionary and established churches all over the known world. And Saul set out and became one of the greatest preachers, one of the greatest missionaries who've ever known. It's because of Paul that we're sitting here today worshiping God. Paul is the one that carried the gospel into Europe. He carried the first gospel message into Europe, and out of Europe came our forefathers, most of us. And that's why we're here today. If we owe anything to any apostle above any other, it would be to Paul because he's responsible for us having this gospel here in America today where our forefathers brought it here years ago and how we thank God for that. But God started that church. Now the church is very important inside of God. You have a lot of church members today that take the church too lightly. They pass up the church like a freight train passing up a tramp. They don't ignore the house of God. It doesn't bother them to sit at home on Sunday and uh, realizing that they ought to be in the house of God. Every true born again believer that's been washed in the precious blood of the Lamb should be in a fundamental Bible believing church on the Lord's day worshiping God. It was customary for Jesus to always go in the temple on the Sabbath or in the synagogue rather. The apostle Paul always made it to the synagogue on the Sabbath back in the days when they met in the synagogues. And so God expects his people to meet in his house on the Lord's day. A lot of people say, well, I just won't go today. They won't miss me. But you forget there's a God in heaven looking at you. And there's a God in heaven knows you did not do what you should have done. And you did not obey him. It's an act of disobedience for you to ignore the house of God on the Lord's day unless you're sick or providentially hindered. We do know there's some that's providentially hindered. We do know there's some that's ill and disabled to be in God's house. There's some that's elderly and not able to come because of their age. But you ought to try to make a way, if at all possible, to be in God's house on the Lord's day. I look forward to being in the house of the Lord. I come out here on Sunday morning at Northside. I can't hardly wait to get here. I look forward to seeing our people come in. And, and I just love to be in the house of the Lord. I long to be there. From the time that God saved me in this present moment, I've always longed to be in God's house. My wife can verify this fact. From time God saved me, the church door never opened unless I was there on Sunday, on Wednesday night, any other time we had services. Before our baby daughter Gay was born, uh, my wife said to me one Sunday night, she said, you know, I believe that I'm going to have to go to the hospital tonight. I said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to church and if you see you have to go before I get back, then you just send for me. I went on to church and came back and carried her to the hospital and Gay was born. I believe in going to the house of God. This day and time, 
you let a baby born into a home and everybody's got to sit at home and hold the baby until it's about a year or two old and then they say, well, I guess the baby's old enough. Let's take you to church. You ought to have that baby in the house of God the time it's eight days old. Back in Bible days, they went in and carried their children to the temple at the age of eight. Raise your children in the house of God. You'd be surprised how the spiritual atmosphere and how the word of God will affect that child as it grows up. Take it to the house of God. That's your responsibility. God expects you to do so. Now, the church in Jerusalem had a humble beginning. Secondly, it was an obedient church. They obeyed the Spirit of God. They didn't have to ask questions or get somebody's opinion around to some religious leader and say, do you think it's all right to serve God? You think it's all right to go to church? They obeyed the Lord. They did what God wanted them to do in that early church. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 12, then returned everyone unto Jerusalem uh, from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem in the seventh day's journey. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Some time ago, there was an old sea captain traveling down the highway, and he picked up a hitchhiker, and he said, young man, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Philadelphia. I'm to make my home there. The old sea captain said, son, uh, do you have a church you plan to attend there? He said, yes, sir, I want to find one. I, in fact, I have my church letter. I want to join one when I get there. The old sea captain said, son, take a little advice to this old sea captain. He said, I was on the sea for many, many years. I've always brought my ships in. I've always tied them down when I brought them in so that they wouldn't be washed away or, or something dam some damage come to them. He said, I was very conscientious about it because I wanted to have a place to tie down my ships to be sure they were safe. And he said, son, when God saved me, I made it my business to find me a good old-fashioned Bible-believing church. And I got in that church and I've been tied down there to the glory of God. And it's a real joy. And he said, I'm very conscientious about being there in that church where God has placed me. He said, son, don't do like some sea captains. Let your ship go and rock about in the wind and the waves carried away. Find you a place where you can worship God. Get in with God's people and you be faithful in serving God. That young man said, the old sea captain, sir, you speak as a man of experience. I'm going to take your advice. When I get to Philadelphia, I'm going to find me a good old time, old fashioned, fundamental Bible believing church. I'll pitch my lot there, sir, and I'll promise you I'll be just as faithful as a clock in attending those church services. Now, it should be that way. That's why the churches many times kind of lag and attendance is off and people don't care on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and other times sometimes on Sunday morning. They just don't have it in their heart like they should have to be faithful in serving God and come to God's house. Now, this is not just a place to drop by and shake hands with people and see what people wear and what kind of hat they got on and what not to get about and come in and out casually. This is a place where people need to come and worship God and take it to heart and come into the house of God with your heart in serving the Lord in God's house. You ought to do that. You, know, you have people that go to church for various reasons. I've known young men looking for a wife, and many times if you want to find a good wife, some young men know where to find them. They go to the house of God. They find them a beautiful young girl. They start courting that girl and, and just look at them. They act so pious that you think they're just waiting for vacancy in the Trinity so they can take over. And they're as pious they can be. And then they act pious and they go to church. They don't miss any services. And then as soon as they get that beautiful, lovely, young Christian girl, you know what happens? They take them out of church. You don't see them often. They come once in a while. They don't much care. That young man allows the devil to work through him to pull that girl out of the church. And that makes me mad as fire. I don't like it. It's as business as that. Young men, when they come into the house of God and call our young girls, if you're not willing to come to church and bring to church after you marry her, then you ought to stay at home and not come in and slip in and out and say, well, I'm going to court her and take her out of the house of God and not let her come back. Well, if you do that, you're working for the devil and she's in trouble and there's trouble down the road as certain as I'm speaking to you today. Beloved, listen to me. You ought to consider the house of God to be a place that's holy, a place to come and worship, a place where you meet God, a place where you're honest and not be dishonest about it, and come to the house of God meaning business. Amen. And so it says here then they will be there. Then this church was in one accord. Now they didn't have division in that church. I thank God for churches where they don't have division. Preacher told me the other day about a church had about 250 in Sunday school, and he said uh, they went off on, a, on some kind of social and when they got off on the social, then the men in charge of the uh, social activities 
wanted uh, the people to dress differently from what they were required to dress within the house of God. They got into a quarrel. They went back and got into fuss in the church and, and got into a big round, split the church, and just tore all the pieces. I feel sorry for a situation like that. That's as good as the devil wants. You got to strive to keep unity in the house of God. Pray for unity in the house of God. Pray that no division or split are coming to the house of God. See, the strategy of Satan is to divide and conquer. If he can get this little click he click here and that little click there, and this little click, then they start clicking one of his heads off, and the church is soon uh, uh, be destroyed as far as the, the sound believing, Bible believing church is concerned, just getting the job done. I thank God for North Side. We don't have any division here. And if I can keep from ever having one here, we won't have one if it's in my power to keep from having one. That's a pastor's responsibility. He's overseer of the flock. He's keep his eyes open and his ears open and try to keep peace in the house of God and no division. He's responsible to a certain extent for any kind of division that might come into the church. Sometimes they come in spite of all the pastor can do. But it's, it, it's his responsibility, if he can, not to allow vision, divisions to come into his church. If he sees the devil working and see a division about to come into the church, he needs to nip the thing in the bud and take care of it before it blossoms out. That's his responsibility. If you don't do that, God will hold him responsible. It's a serious matter when a church gets all divided up and split up, then the cause of Christ is hurt and damage is done. That will never, never be healed completely. I'll see it happen. Uh, in my days gone by, in early years of my ministry, if I had my time to go over, I had some little things to happen that never happened if I had my time to go over again. But hindsight, of, of course, is better than foresight, I suppose. You live and learn as you move along. But you need to strive to keep things moving forward to the glory of God. And they were all in one accord. The Bible says in Acts 2, 1, when their Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, they continued daily and all in one accord. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple. You don't find these preachers fighting each other. The Bible said they went up together into the temple. Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, all they believed were together had all things common. So you see they had uh, a one accord in this church. They had union. While well, you can take instruments, you that play instruments, if you don't have the thing in tune, have it all fixed up, then, uh, then that makes a terrible noise. You have discord. And you can't very well enjoy discord uh, whenever you're trying to play instruments that's out of tune and don't, you're not in one accord. And so God's people in the house of God should be of one accord and love the Lord and love each other and strive together for unity. That's the way it should be. And not only that, but number four, this church was a spirit-filled church. They were spirit-filled. Every individual, each individual can be filled with God's spirit. You know that? That's right. Now, when we all get filled with God's Spirit, then we have a church filled with the Spirit of God. Now, he's here this morning. The Holy Ghost is here, but maybe all of us are not filled with the Spirit of God as we should be. Now, you may say, Preacher Edwards, how do you get filled with the Spirit? What does it do for you? Now, the filling of the Spirit of God is not like pouring glass water in a glass. You can take a glass up here, and then you pour water in it. You see the thing be filling up. That's not the way you feel with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't fill you like that. The word fill with the Holy Ghost means completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. When you're completely controlled by the Spirit of God, that's when you're filled with the Spirit of God. Now you must keep that in mind. They were all filled with God's Spirit. The Bible said in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house while they were sitting. It filled all the house. The Spirit of God came in great power, came upon them and in them and brought them together and united them together and they were filled with God's Spirit. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verses 15 through 18 that the outsiders thought they were all drunk on new wine. While they said that bunch of uh, Christians and Christ followers in there, they're all drunk. They're in there singing and they're in there praising God and they're quoting the Psalms and they're, they're all drunk in there. Simon Peter stood up and said, Why, well, we are not drunk. We are not drunk as you suppose you think. Well, it's only the ninth hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. Now, people didn't get drunk by nine o'clock in the morning. This day and time, they don't get sober by that time. But back then, they didn't dare to get drunk by nine in the morning. And so he said, These are not drunk as you suppose. See, it's just nine o'clock in the morning. He said, This is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. 
in the last days I'll pour out the Spirit of God upon you. And it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And they went forward filled with God's Spirit, filled with joy, filled with boldness, and witnessing for God. Now the fullness or the complete control of God's Spirit will make you bold in the Lord. It'll give you joy. It'll give you peace. It'll give you power you need to get the job done. It's not more degrees we need today. We have the most highly educated ministry that the church age has ever known. We have the most highly educated church workers that the church has ever known in this thing about. And we, I'm sorry to say we have less power with God. What we need is the power of the Holy Ghost up on our endeavors. That's not a one of us here, but what can be used of God. If you can't read your name in box call letters, if you got the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do things for God. Dwight L. Moody never finished grammar school. He only finished the fifth grade and hardly got through the fifth grade in school. But Dwight L. Moody was never an ordained preacher, but he could witness and he could preach and teach. Never ordained to be a minister. That man went out less than fifth grade education. Filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, took England in one hand as it were America in the other hand, rocked them together for God and robbed hell of over a million people. That man won over a million people to God in his lifetime. He was a great soul winner. He went out witnessing for the Lord and went out and got the job done. Now this church back in Jerusalem was a praying church. Now that's one of our greatest needs today. We might as well admit it. I wouldn't embarrass you. I'd hate to embarrass anyone, but I, I just wondered. If I should ask how many of you spent at least um, 10 minutes in prayer since last Sunday, you'd be greatly embarrassed. You would want to lie about it, and you'd be greatly embarrassed. Now, you know yourself whether you spent at least 10 minutes in prayer since last Sunday. While people back in there in the church, they spent hours in prayer. They went to the church at the hour of prayer and prayed and spent hours on their knees before God. Every last one of us prayed too little. We don't pray like we should, and that's one reason we don't have the power in God's house today like we ought to have, like they had back in those days. And they prayed. The Bible said uh, in uh, uh, verse, Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. That was 9 o'clock in the morning. They went up to pray. Or rather 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm sorry. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they went up to pray. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken. When they had prayed, the place was shaken by the power of God's Spirit. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, but you will give yourselves continue to prayer and to the ministry of the Word of God. That's why they chose seven men to serve tables, that the preachers might give themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word of God. Now, a preacher has to pray, he has to study, he has to prepare himself for the ministry. And that's why you have deacons in your church to help the preach out in things that they can do so he can have his time for prayer and the study of God's word. Then number six, this was a going church. They went everywhere telling the old, old story. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, and they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. There you have your house to house visitation program. They went from house to house, knocking on doors, telling people about Jesus. Now, I mentioned Dwight L. Moody a moment ago. He was a man that believed in witnessing for God. Now, this church here witnessed for the Lord. They witnessed daily for God. They didn't wait till just Sunday to pray about it or tell somebody about God. They witnessed every day and every time they had an opportunity. Dwight L. Moody was a man that believed in witnessing for Jesus every day. In fact, he made a vow to God. He said, God, if you'll give me grace and strength and health, I'll never let a day pass by without personally telling somebody about Jesus every day that you let me live upon the earth. He made that vow to God. One day, Dwight El Moody was real busy, and he went to bed that night, and he had to say, I haven't, I haven't told anybody today personally about Jesus. And he got up out of the bed and put on his clothes, and it's about 11 o'clock at night, and he went down the street. A tall man leaning up against the light post, walked up and tapped him upon the shoulder and said to him, said, Mr., said, uh, I come to find out if you, you know, do you know grace? He said, Who, what do you mean grace? He said, I'm talking about the grace of God. He said, no, I don't guess I do. And he said, well, I'll tell you, uh, sir, I, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you about the grace of God. I want to get you saved. He said, oh, well, uh, uh, that, that's none of your business. And, and Mr. Moody said, that, that is my business. Oh, he said, then you must be Mr. Moody. He said, yes, I'm Mr. Moody. And he talked to the man, witnessed to him. The man did not come to Christ. And Mr. Moody went back and went to bed. He told the man before he left, he said, at any time that I can help you, uh, if you want to get saved, 
I, he told him, where you live, you come knock on my door. I'll open the door and invite you in and tell you about Jesus Christ. Mr. Moody went back and went to bed about 3 o'clock that morning. Somebody banged on his door like it's going to tear it down. He got up and went to the door. That stood that man. He had been crying. He was trembling. He said, Mr. Moody, I hadn't been able to rest. I can't go to sleep. I can't eat. I can't do anything. Since you talked to me up there last night and said, uh, I just want to get saved. I, I want to get right with God. Mr. Moody said, man, come on in. Came on in. He took the Bible and led the man to Jesus Christ. Now, Dwight L. Moody was a man that took the advantage of every opportunity he had to try to witness to somebody. And very few do that today. Not many preachers, let alone lay people, take the opportunity and advantage they have to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. But that was a witness in church. And then it was a God fearing. They feared God. You don't have many people today that fear God. They feared God. Beloved, if they didn't do what God wanted them to do, if they didn't go to the prayer meeting, if they didn't go to church, if they didn't witness, they didn't pray, they feared God. And therefore, because they feared the Lord, God gave them great power. In Acts 2, 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Acts chapter 5, verse 11, and great fear came upon all the church, and as many as heard these things. The trouble in our church this day, there's no fear of God in the hearts of the people. People get up on Sunday and take off I see a uh, uh, cousin Jane uh, across the mountains, um, Aunt Mary or Uncle John or somebody, and never even think about the house of God on the Lord's day. They can lay in bed on Sunday morning, never think about getting out of the bed and going to the house of God. There's no fear of God in their hearts. That's why they do it. They just don't love God and don't fear God. Now, there's some that can't because of age and some because of being providence to hinder, some because of illness, but multitudes could, but there's no fear of God. And then again, this church was a giving church. The church in that day believed in Christian giving. Every born again believer ought to believe in Christian giving. It's biblical. It's taught all the way through the Bible. It's uh, doing God's business. It's financing God's works, laying up treasures in heaven. Every born again believer ought to at least tie their income in the work of God. And then above that, you ought to give Jesus a love gift along. Above your tithe because you love him. And God will bless you. The first fruit belongs to God. Give God his part. You take care of God's business and God will take care of yours. You ignore God and his business, God will ignore you and your business. Yeah, you better mark that down. Now you honor God, God will honor you. And then finally, this was a persecuted church. They went everywhere telling the people about Jesus. They were persecuted. Acts chapter 5 verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak the name of Jesus and they let them go. But they went everywhere uh, speaking the name of Jesus. They were whipped. They were put to death. They cut uh, John's brother James' head off. They uh, stoned Stephen to death. They put Peter in jail. And every last one of the apostles were martyred for the cause of God. They were put to death for the cause of God except John. We don't know how John died. He was the younger of the twelve and he, uh, he lived outlived the others. They did throw him in a barrel of hot oil and he escaped out of that and lived longer. But he lived to be an old man, and we don't know how he died. But all the rest died. I assume they put him to death in the end. I assume that all 11 of those apostles, including Paul, which made 12, were put to death for the cause of Jesus Christ. Of course, Judas Iscariot was never saved without hanging himself. And God uh, raised up Paul in his place. Now I believe all 12 of them died a martyr's death. That meant they'll all get a martyr's reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And when you suffer persecution for the cause of God, Put forth that special effort, sacrifice, serve God when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. Go ahead and serve God anyway. God keeps a record. And God rewards you for it at the end of life's journey. I brought you a message on the church in Jerusalem. As we see the church in Jerusalem, we wonder how far short we come when we take a look at the church in Jerusalem. Let's search our hearts and ask God to help us to be like these believers as we sojourn for the Lord. You listen well. Stand to your feet, please, for a word of prayer. Our Father, I pray that you'll take the message today and use it, not only here in Northside Baptist Church, but also out in the radio listening audience. Pray that you'll have you in this invitation. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified in all we say and do. We'll thank you, our Father, for whatever you do. In the precious holy name of our dear Lord, amen. Now listen to me. Debbie's going to play for us. As Debbie plays on the instrument, if you're here today unsaved, if you're here today walking afar off, if you're here today looking for a church home, or for any reason God may impress upon you to come forward, you just walk down this aisle and we'll help you today. Just obey the Lord while she plays a couple of stanzas. How about it?
night and while we wait, would you obey the Lord? God is speaking. I've delivered the message. God laid on my heart. It's up to you now to do something about it. 